Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody out this afternoon, and uh, for those of you joining us on television, we uh, want to welcome you, and we always appreciate when folks write and uh, they tell us they feel like they're sitting right there on the back row, and it reminds them of uh, a college classroom. Well, that's just exactly the way we want you to feel. We're not here to preach at anybody. We're just here to teach the Word, and uh, the only way you can teach is use the textbook. And, of course, that's another thing. We always appreciate that uh, all of you folks come in with your own Bible. Again, for those of you in television, we just want to thank you for your prayers. We thank you for your financial support, your letters. My, how we enjoy your letters. And uh, you've learned that we don't like them four or five pages long because that would take a lot of our time. So keep them short and uh, to the point, and you rest assured that Iris and I read every letter. We have never yet missed reading a letter. So uh, don't feel that you're just writing it to a staff. Uh, that almost reminds me of cats, isn't it? Dogs are friends and cats think you're staff. But uh, when you write to our ministry, you're not just writing to staff. You, you rest assured that Iris and I are reading it. Okay, we're going to jump right in where we left off in our last taping. We're spending a little time in the book of Isaiah. We're not going to take all 66 chapters verse by verse like we did Romans and some of the others. But we're going to hit some of the highlights, and uh, remembering the background, as I'm always stressing, whenever you read a portion of Scripture, always determine who's writing, to whom is he writing, when was it written, what are the circumstances, and uh, so bear with me as I keep reminding you that this is all back in about 700 B.C. that Isaiah is writing, and uh, the nation of Israel has been split between the two kingdoms, the northern kingdom with ten tribes, the southern kingdom with the two tribes of Benjamin and Judah, the temple is still operating. So when we look at all their idolatry, don't think for a minute that the temple isn't still there. They, they go into idolatry in spite of it. But uh, then we're going to find, as I put on the timeline on the board, I finally got it up here, been threatening to all the time, that all the way back to the time of Nebuchadnezzar, which was 606 B.C., 600 years before Christ, is when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came and besieged Jerusalem, finally broke through, destroyed the city, destroyed the temple, and took, for the most part, the whole nation of Israel out to Babylon for 70 years. And then, as we're going to see in one of our further programs this afternoon, the next empire that comes on the scene is the Medes and the Persians, who, of course, defeat the Babylonians. And uh, the king of the Medes and Persians, then, will be what God calls his servant, who will give the decree to Ezra, Nehemiah, and so forth, to now go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple first. And then, about 100 years later, Nehemiah goes back and starts rebuilding the city walls. Now, it's interesting, and I think this bears repeating. That In fact, let's look at it in Scripture. Come back with me to Leviticus 26. And this is an appropriate time to use this verse. Leviticus 26. Now, you see, God is speaking while they're still there in Egypt. This is even before they've come out of Egypt. And yet the prophecy stands looking forward to, of course, the first time is this 70-year captivity. And then the second time, as we've shown on the board, I better point it out or you won't know what I'm talking about. No, I haven't got it on here. I, I goofed. I, I went ahead and took the prophecy. But anyway, from history now, we know that uh, in 70 A.D., in 70 A.D., we have Titus destroying the temple and sending Israel again into the dispersion so that the land was emptied, and uh, I went ahead and used the prophetic timeline, but historically now, 70 A.D., or 40 years after Christ was crucified, the Romans came in and did the same thing to Jerusalem and the temple that the Babylonians did back here, 
And then when the land is empty, now this is the amazing thing, any time that the land is emptied of the Jew, Leviticus 26 tells us what's going to happen. All right, now I've got to find it back a minute, honey, just a second. Leviticus chapter 26, and uh, drop down to verse 32. Leviticus 26, verse 32, and remember the timing now. This is Moses writing while they are still in Egypt. Maybe they're out of Egypt anyway, but it's during the time of Moses. He's writing, but look what it says. And God is speaking to the nation. He said, I will bring the land, that is the promised land. I will bring the land into desolation. Your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. That is the desolation. But in God's own time, he says, verse 33, I will scatter you among the heathen, that is the non-Jewish world, what we call Gentiles, and I will draw out a sword after you. They're going to suffer persecution. And... Uh, your land shall be desolate, your cities waste, and then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath. Now this is a direct reference to the 70-year captivity. Then shall the land, that is the promised land, enjoy her Sabbath, the sabbatical year, that every seventh year the ground was to be left fallow, give it a, a rest, and they never did it. So over a period of 490 years, neglecting the sabbatical year, God owed, they owed God 70 years. And so he's going to get it back. All right, that's what he's talking about. The land will enjoy her Sabbath, that every seventh year, as long as it lieth, what? Desolate. And you will be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. And as long as it lieth desolate, It'll rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths, that in your sabbatical year, when you dwelt upon, in other words, they kept it in production. All right, now I think while you're in Leviticus, we might as well use another verse that I use so often, Deuteronomy chapter 30. <clears throat> verse 1, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1. And remember, this is always apropos when God removes Israel from the promised land, whether it's 606 or whether it's 70 A.D., it's still going to pretty much be under the same processes. The only difference is on the third one that we've been talking about in Isaiah is when the judgment of the tribulation comes and goes and Christ's return, then, of course, Israel will never again be scattered out of her land. But the first two times they were. The first one, as we're looking at now, again in this lesson today, in the uh, Babylonian captivity, they were gone only 70 years. In the second one, when Titus overran the city and destroyed the temple, they were dispersed for 1900 and some years until they came back in 1948. All right, but here's the, here's the process, if I may call it that. It shall come to pass, Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. It shall come to pass when all these things are come upon you, the blessings and the curse which I have set before you, and thou shalt call them to mind, or you're going to be remembering them, when you are among all the nations. All the nations, not just some of them. When you are among all the nations where the Lord thy God hath driven thee. Now, of course, you have to know history. At the time of the Babylonian captivity, the world was still, the known world was still pretty small. The only known part of the planet was the area around the Mediterranean and on out to the Far East. They knew nothing of the New World. They knew nothing of the Western Hemisphere. And so the all nations at 70 uh, or in 606 BC were a lot fewer in number than the all nations of 70 AD when they would finally end up around the whole planet, see? But now, either, either time, whether it was 606 or whether it was at the end of the next one, which was, like I said, in 1948, this is what's going to happen. 
Verse 2, And thou shalt return. Now that's plain language, isn't it? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that. That after they have been scattered by God's sovereign design, when He is ready, He will bring them back. And He did. When Cyrus, the uh, Mede-Persian emperor, made a decree that they were to go back and rebuild the city and the, and the city gates. All right, in 1900, thereabouts, the Jews finally started putting things in order that they could get ready to come back to the Holy Land again. And then we saw the nation suddenly appear and uh, become a nation then in 1948. All right, so here's the promise, that they would be scattered and that while they're scattered, while they are out of the land, the land of Palestine or Israel, however you want to put it, will become desolate. Now, isn't it amazing? You would think that as soon as the Jew was gone, the Arab world would have come in and taken advantage of it, taken advantage of the production of those vineyards and those orchards and those wheat and barley fields. But did they? No. Don't you ever believe it? They never lifted a finger to put the land back into production when Israel was taken out. It remained desolate both times. For the 70 years while they were in Babylon, oh, sure, there were a few uh, Bedouins and then there were a few Arabs in the area, but not enough to bring them. In fact, I can just prove that. I didn't intend to do any of this. I don't know why this came up. But anyhow, this is in Nehemiah. Now turn up to Nehemiah with me so you can see what I'm talking about. Nehemiah chapter 2. Now this is when Cyrus gave the decree. Cyrus was a servant of Jehovah, the Bible tells us. He was by design brought into a place of power where he would have the authority and the sovereignty to send Nehemiah and his company of Jews back to Jerusalem, could give them whatever they needed out of the forest for their lumber, and they had full authority. But now look at the setting after 70 years. In fact, uh, by the time Nehemiah comes, it's, it's more like 170 years because he comes back much later than Ezra who came after the 70 years. So Nehemiah is really writing almost 100, I'm going to be on the safe side, 150 years after the fact. Now you would have thought that when the native people are gone, that the neighbors around would have just come in and taken advantage of it. What do you think the world would do if all of a sudden all of us Americans were relocated out of our country? What would the rest of the world do? Why, they'd come in like a flood and take over everything that we've got. They would put everything in production. They would enjoy our homes. But see, the Arabs didn't do that when the Jews left. They left as well for the most part. And so here's the setting by the time Nehemiah comes back. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17. Then I said unto them, You see the distress that we are in, that is, he and his fellow Jews, how Jerusalem lieth, what? Waste. They hadn't cleaned it up after the Babylonians besieged it. They hadn't had got back into populating it. No, it was still laying waste 150, 60 years after. And the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more reproach. And then there's another one, uh, I think, where is it? In chapter 4, where it speaks of the, uh, the rubbish and the trash that they had to clean up. Well, anyway, you can come over to chapter 4. And the same opposition, I can make that point, if nothing else, that they have today. Nothing has changed. Because, you see, all during the time of 70 A.D. until the Jews came back after the turn of the century, 
The Arab world didn't come in and occupy it. Now, Arafat would like to make us think so, but it is not true. It was a desolation. I've, I've read the, the, the comment of uh, Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, who traveled back in the middle 1800s. You've heard me read it over and over. And he said, the place is a total desolation. Not even the weeds of the desert grow here. The wild animals of the desert are gone. They never saw a soul driving all day. They finally got to Jerusalem, and he said, there were a few people there, of course, but it was a desolate place. He said, I would never want to live there. So where do these people get the idea that when the Jews were gone those 1900 years, that the Arab world made it verdant, that's the word they like to use, V-E-R-D-A-N-T, verdant or verdant, however you want to pronounce it, and that it was in great production? No, it wasn't. It was desolate like God said it would be. And so here in Nehemiah chapter 4 now then, when they come back and try to rebuild the walls, let bring you down to uh, verse 15 of Nehemiah 4. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us and God had brought their counsel to nothing that we returned all of us to the wall, everyone to his work, that is the city wall, not the wailing wall, but the, the outer wall of the city, which was the number one line of defense. All right? And uh, it came to pass, verse 16, from that time forth that half of my servants wrought in the work, the other half of them held the spears and the shields and the bows and the harbingers, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They who build on the wall and they that bear the burden were those that laid it, in other words, carrying the mortar and the bricks and the whatever. Everyone, now watch this, just like today, everyone with one of his hands worked in the work, and with the other hand he what? He held a weapon because the Arabs were constantly trying to thwart the work of rebuilding the city wall and the gates and so forth. So it's no different then than it is today. But on the other hand, I want to make the point that when God emptied the Jew out of the land, it became desolate. It was non-productive. Earthquakes kept anybody from building. Disease, malaria kept anybody from uh, enjoying a healthy lifestyle. And the water the, was in short. The rain stopped. And so all those things, God made sure that when the children of Israel were out of the land, it was desolate. Never forget that. All right, so now then back to Isaiah 42. Now we can take off where we intended to start in the first place. That as Israel comes under the chastisement of Jehovah, and when God takes them out of the land, their neighbors don't come in and enjoy it, but instead it becomes desolate. And that has happened over and over, but especially in 606 and again in 70 A.D. All right, Isaiah 42, and we're going to drop in at verse 8. And remember in our last program we were talking about how Israel was being groomed and prepared to be the missionaries and the evangelists to the Gentile world. That's their whole purpose. God is getting them ready for the coming of their king, their Messiah, and their Redeemer. And then if they could have the king and his kingdom, they could evangelize those pagan Gentiles. All right, but now here in verse 8, we're going to be aware that Israel's number one problem leading up to the Babylonian captivity was idolatry. Idolatry. Now that just almost seems impossible to comprehend. How could a nation of people that had experienced the miraculous power of their God, uniquely to them, holding back their enemies and blessing them like no other nation on earth, brought them through the Red Sea, 40 years later brought them through the River Jordan at flood time, was watching over them constantly, giving them promise after promise after promise, and yet they went whole hog for idolatry. It's just utterly hard to believe. And so this is what we're building up for, see, that they are, uh, are going to have to be dealt with because of their 
idolatry. All right, verse 8, I am the Lord. That is my name, and my glory I will not give to another. In other words, he's not going to share it with an idolatrous God. Neither my praise to graven images. See what he's talking about? I am not going to let you take praise and worship away from me and give it to some dumb idol. But that's what they were doing. All right, verse 9, Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare before they spring forth, I tell you them. What's he talking about? His foreknowledge. God knows what's going to happen. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows what's going to happen 100 years from now. There is nothing that he is not aware of. All right, so now then, verse 10, he comes back in, in an instruction. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise from the end of the earth, that you go down to the sea and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof, that the wilderness, the desert, and the cities thereof lift up their voice, the villages that Kadar doth inhabit. Let the inhabitants of the rocks sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. That's what God expects. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare His praise in the islands or within the borders. Now, verse 13, we're going to see the other side of God. He's a God of blessing. He's a God of joy. He's a God of happiness. But He's also the God of wrath and discipline. So now we see that other side. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He's going to come in and he's going to be ruthless with them. He shall cry, yea, roar. He'll prevail against his enemies, not Israel's especially, but God's. I have long time holding my peace. I've been still. God's gracious, remember. He takes a long time to get God to a place of meeting out judgment. I have been still and refrained myself. Now I will cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. I will make waste mountains and hills. I'll dry up their herbs. I'll make the rivers islands. I'll dry up the pools. I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake. Now, this is one thing I have to constantly remind you. No matter how far Israel goes down, whether it's, whether it's unbelief like at Kadesh Barnea or whether it's idolatry like we're dealing with here, yet here is the promise. Now I've got to bring you back to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7, and all the way through the book of Isaiah, I want you to be reminded of this constant promise. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now he's talking to David, and he's setting things in order to go down the eons of time coming to the birth of Christ. And it's going to be through the lineage of King David. So who, this is who he's talking to. All right, now then. Verse 15. He gives them the either oars. Verse 14. I guess better read that verse before we go into 15. Verse 14 where God tells David concerning not just Solomon, but this whole lineage of the house of David that will be coming down the pipe. God says, I will be his father, he shall be my son, if he commit iniquity. See, there it comes. And God knows they will. If he commit iniquity. Now, we're talking about the nation of Israel in, in total. I will chasten him with the rod of men. I will bring in enemy armies. I'll bring in enemy empires that will tax you. They'll overlord you. All right? I will chase thee with a rod of men, with the stripes of the children of men. Verse 15, what's the first word? But, see? Even though God will chasten and He will discipline, but my mercy shall not depart away from Him. 
Now that's the constant promise that God holds before the nation of Israel, that even though he will bless them and they will bring chastisement, yet his mercy will never depart. Now here we are, 4,000 years after the nation made its appearance, and they've been through the, the throes of persecution. There has been a constant satanic effort to destroy them, they have never gained any great numbers of people, but then neither have they disappeared. And of course, that's the miracle of the nation of Israel today. As I've said over and over in seminars and in our classes in Oklahoma, most of you have heard me say it over and over. They should have disappeared 1,900 years ago. They should have lost their identity through intermarriage, through persecution, through martyrdom, whatever. But here they are in the news, every day. How can anybody not see that? That here this little nation of people that should have disappeared have anything but disappeared. They're in the news like no other little nation on earth. It's just unbelievable except it's what the Word of God has declared. All right, so now then coming back for just a second, our time is just about gone. We come on time to verse 14. Isn't that where I was? No, I went down a little further. Uh, verse 17. Verse 17. They shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images that say to the molten images, You are our gods. Can you imagine? Well, who's he talking about? Israel. Not the pagan world. That's a given that they were idolaters. Even old terror, you remember, the father of Abraham was an idolater. But Israel, they have now come hundreds and hundreds of years since becoming a nation. They've had the prophets. They've had the five books of Torah. They've had Moses. And yet, the nation, with the exception of a remnant, we'll look at that maybe in the next program or two, but for the most part, the nation has fallen in total rejection of the God of Abraham. They are falling into idolatry. They're following the gods of the pagans around them. Why? When God has been so good to them. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.